With the darkness, one soul rose wondrously from among the new slain dead and stole away in the moonlight. The ground where he'd lain was soaked with blood and with urine from the voided bladders of the animals, and he went forth stained and stinking, like some reeking issue of the incarnate dam of war herself. The savages had moved to higher ground, and he could see the light from their fires and hear them singing. A strange and plaintive chanting up there where they'd gone to roast mules. He made his way among the pale and dismembered, among the sprawled and leg-flung horses, and he took a reckoning by the stars and set off south afoot. The night wore a thousand shapes out there in the brush, and he kept his eyes to the ground ahead. Starlight and waning moon made a faint shadow of his wanderings on the dark of the desert, and all along the ridges the wolves were howling and moving north toward the slaughter. He walked all night and still he could see the fires behind him. The rind of a moon that had been in the sky all day was gone, and they followed the trail through the desert by starlight. The Pleiades straight overhead and very small, and the great bear walking the mountains to the north. My arm stinks, said Sproul. What? I said my arm stinks. You want me to look at it? What for? You can't do nothing for it. Well, you suit yourself. I aim to, said Sproul. They went on. Twice in the night they heard the little prairie vipers rattle among the scrub and they were afraid. With the dawn, they were climbing among shale and windstone under the wall of a dark monocline where turrets stood like basalt prophets. And they passed by the side of the road little wooden crosses propped in cairns of stone where travelers had met with death. The road winding up among the hills and the castaways laboring upon the switchbacks blackening under the sun, their eyeballs inflamed and the painted spectra racing out at the corners. Climbing up through Ocotillo and Prickly Pear, where the rocks trembled and sleared in the sun, rock and no water, and the sandy trace, and they kept watch for any green thing that might tell of water, but there was no water. They ate pignole from a bag with their fingers and went on. Through the noon heat and into the dusk, where lizards lay with their leather chins flat to the cooling rocks and fending off the world with thin smiles and eyes like cracked stone plates. They crested the mountain at sunset and they could see for miles. An immense lake lay below them with the distant blue mountains standing in the windless span of water in the shape of a soaring hawk and trees that shimmered in the heat and a distant city very white against the blue and shaded hills. They sat and watched. They saw the sun drop under the jagged rim of the earth to the west, and they saw it flare behind the mountains, and they saw the face of the lake darken and the shape of the city dissolve upon it. They slept among the rocks face up like dead men, and in the morning when they rose, there was no city, and no trees, and no lake, only a barren, dusty plain. Sproul groaned and collapsed back among the rocks. The kid looked at him. There were blisters along his lower lip, and his arm through the ripped shirt was swollen and something foul had seeped through among the darker bloodstains. He turned back and looked out over the valley. The kid spat dryly and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. A lizard came out from under a rock and crouched on its small cocked elbows over that piece of froth and drank it dry and returned to the rock again, leaving only a faint spot in the sand which vanished almost instantly. They rode five days through desert and mountain and through dusty pueblos where the populace turned out to see them, their escorts in varied suits of time-worn finery, the prisoners in rags. They'd been given blankets and squatting by the desert fires at night, sun blackened and bony, and wrapped in these serapes, they looked like gods profound as peons. The soldiers, none spoke English, and they directed their charges with grunts or gestures. They were indifferently armed, and they were much afraid of the Indians. They rolled their tobacco in corn husks, and they sat by the fire in silence and listened to the night. Their talk, when they talked, 
was of witches or worse, and always they sought to parcel from the darkness some voice or cry from among the cries that was no right beast. La gente dice que el coyote es un brujo. Muchas veces el brujo es un coyote. Y los indios también. Muchas veces llaman como los coyotes. ¿Y qué es eso? Nada. Un tecalote, nada más. Quizás. When they rode through the gap in the mountains and looked down on the city, the sergeant of the expedition halted the horses and spoke to the man behind him, and he in turn dismounted and took rawhide thongs from his saddlebag and approached the prisoners and gestured for them to cross their wrists and hold them out, showing how with his own hands. He tied them each in this manner, and then they rode on. They entered the city in a gantlet of flung offal, driven like cattle through the cobbled streets with shouts going up behind for the soldiery, who smiled as became them and nodded among the flowers and proffered cups, herding the tattered fortune seekers through the plaza, where water splashed in a fountain and idlers reclined on carven seats of white porphyry, and past the governor's palace, and past the cathedral where vultures squatted along the dusty entablatures, and among the niches in the carved facade hard by the figures of Christ and the apostles, the birds holding out their own dark vestments in postures of strange benevolence, while about them flapped on the wind the dried scalps of slaughtered Indians strung on cords, the long dull hair swinging like the filaments of certain sea forms and the dry hides clapping against the stones. They passed old alms seekers by the church door with their seamy palms outheld and maimed beggars sad-eyed in rags and children asleep in the shadows with flies walking their dreamless faces. Dark coppers in a clack dish, the shriveled eyes of the blind, Scribes crouched by the steps with their quills and ink pots and bowls of sand and lepers moaning through the streets and naked dogs that seemed composed of bone entirely and vendors of tamales and old women with faces dark and harrowed as the land squatting in the gutters over charcoal fires where blackened strips of anonymous meat sizzled and spat. Some orphans were abroad like irate dwarfs and foals and sots drooling and flailing about in the small markets of the metropolis, and the prisoners rode past the carnage in the meat stalls, and the waxy smell where racks of guts hung black with flies, and flayings of meat in great red sheets now darkened with the advancing day, and the flensed and naked skulls of cows and sheep with their dull blue eyes glaring wildly, and the stiff bodies of defer and javelin, and ducks, and quail, and parrots, all wild things from the country round, hanging head downward from hooks. Foremost among them, outsized and childlike with his naked face, rode the judge. His cheeks were ruddy, and he was smiling and bowing to the ladies, and doffing his filthy hat. The enormous dome of his head when he bared it was blinding white, and perfectly circumscribed about so that it looked to have been painted. 